The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. with the dead in a dead language. Well may it be in Latin. The creative spirit of the dead Hartman leads me towards the skulls, invokes them. The skulls begin to glow softly. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, bringing you the second part of Mussorgsky's Catacombs, which is essentially its own movement, a version of the opening promenade that's tacked on to the ending of that huge brass chorale that we heard in the last lecture, enough of its own section to merit a final bar ending between the two sections. With the dead in the language of the dead. Right. I feel that this is a bit of a tribute to Hartman. It's spooky, yes, and it has that sense of mystery and suspense and anxiety, perhaps, of being around a catacomb, which is not the funnest place to hang out, really. I suppose if you're a grave digger or if you're the manager of the catacombs, being there amongst the peaceful remains doesn't spook you at all, but to the average human being who's not used to looking at human remains, it's probably not the funnest place to hang out on a Saturday night. What makes this a tribute is that you hear the Mussorgsky theme coming back, his own depiction of himself walking around and observing things at the exhibition. And here it comes in as a beautifully plaintive minor interpretation in the left hand, but of course above middle C for the most part, scored in treble clef. And not with exactly the same rhythmic values to the melody. The left hand comes in again on the bass, interpreting more of that particular theme and the top just slowly settles down, sometimes in eerie half steps, sometimes in more melodic whole steps and larger melodic intervals. And it's all beautifully picturesque and, of course, spooky. Mussorgsky is definitely trying to add the artifice here of being spooky, being in a place that is eerie. This is a cool way of scoring this. The right hand continuing to play F-sharp tremolos, and then inside of that we see four-part harmony, including a little bit of melody in there, which is doubled at the octave. So the held F-sharps are more of an essence, right, rather than an actual thing. This continues on and so on, perdendosi, so everything is really dying away aggressively. And once again, we've got these beautiful arpeggiations here. Really sounds like Mussorgsky intended this to be scored on harp. Whether this was intended to be orchestrated or not, it's still a sign that Mussorgsky was always reaching farther. Right? He had a tendency to add dimensions to things, that could be exploited on later, say in this case as an orchestration, or I understand that the original first draft of Boris Godunov was possibly intended to be like a cycle of operas rather than just a single massive opera. And that his friends talked him out of that idea and got him to cut it down to one longer opera. I'm not sure if that's true. That was something I read a long time ago, but it wouldn't surprise me because of other things that I've seen about 
Mussorgsky's life and his character and his musical efforts. Speaking of very spooky movements, spooky music that he wrote, the most famous, of course, is Night on the Bald Mountain, or Night on Bear Mountain. This is a piece that he wrote mostly for its own sake, originally, but he tried to put it into some of his operas, and he kept trying over and over again to fit this creepy piece of music and to find some context, even in the most harmless opera that has nothing to do with spookiness, uh, he would try to put in this piece, Night on the Bald Mountain on St. John's Eve, which would be kind of the equivalent of Halloween, right? Or uh, some particular night of the year, which might be associated by very superstitious people as being when the witches would hold a black mass. And he never quite got around to it, and eventually the piece was reorchestrated and reorganized by Rimsky-Korsakov. But you can hear both versions today. You can hear the Mussorgsky version, which is usually called Night on the Bald Mountain on St. John's Eve, as opposed to just Night on the Bald Mountain or Night on Bald Mountain, as orchestrated by Rimsky-Korsakov, both of which are really worth listening to. The Rimsky-Korsakov version has extremely powerful, beautiful orchestration, obviously the guy knows what he's doing, and he is a virtuoso of orchestration. Whereas Mussorgsky's is more artistic and has a kind of a lovable quality to it. I'm not being patronizing or anything like that, but it just feels more of an effort of somebody who's just being honest and finding their way around and enjoying themselves and just having a hell of a good time, if you know what I mean. So let's hear the piano version of this after that long introduction. And speaking of long, since this is Andante non troppo, con lamento, it's going to take quite a few minutes, but really listen to the vibe and listen to the tempos and then we will dig into the Ravel orchestration after that. Thank you. 
Before we launch into this analysis, let's take a look at the orchestral numbers that Ravel is calling for here. So as far as the winds are concerned, pretty much all of the standard winds and their doublings, piccolo, English horn, bass clarinet, contrabassoon. However, the massive lower brass are being left out and all we are left with is four horns and one muted trumpet, which actually has very limited participation on the next screen. In fact, the actual score for the second half of this movement comes down to about two screens worth of information, but there is so much to cover that this section really needs its own lecture, even though it might be on the short side. So as before, we're starting with this high F-sharp octave tremolo in the firsts, divisi and muted. Now the first realization of the little chordal melody is in oboe and English horn. And what I think is really beautiful here is, as orchestrated, you really hear the relationship between this music and Boris Gudinov. In fact, this could have been taken right out of one of the pages of Boris Gudinov, these uh, five beats right here. The way that the harmony condenses and condenses down to a single note. It's just really beautiful and gripping, I feel. And here is a situation where Atu on oboe can work. Very delicately, very gently played by two players who are very used to listening to each other. But it's still going to be slightly scary <laughs> to just really make this match up between the two players. Especially Espressivo, if they have to perfectly match the vibrato and everything else. Probably just letting the vibrato kind of cool off here at the end of the phrase is going to be helpful for both players. As you'll recall in the original piano score, after these first three bars, we have the tremolo descending in the right hand and left hand playing octaves from below in a further extension of the developed melody. Very simple scoring here too. Second violins dovetailing onto the top note of that F-sharp octave, violas taking the bottom note and then descending little by little. And that's very cool because that gives the firsts a chance to come in dovetailing over the top of this octave where this ends up settling, right? Meanwhile, the melody in the bass is very simply orchestrated. Notice the balance here. Pianissimo strings and piano in these double reeds down here, the bassoons and contrabassoon, plus bass clarinet. So these elements are supposed to be slightly foreground, while the strings just provide a bit of blending cushion behind them to take off some of the roughness of doubling. So that is a neat trick so long as it's very understandable by the conductor and the players, right? The conductor might recommend to the bassoonists and contrabassoon, bass clarinet, come out a little bit and strings be a little bit in the back. And the conductor might do that with just a hand gesture, waving down the lower strings a little bit and allowing the double reeds to come out more. And that will actually be immediately understood by the players. Nevertheless, this is a beautifully spooky movement. As I was saying before, Mussorgsky had a taste for the macabre, and I feel that this is a very strong example of that, wonderfully conceived orchestrally by Ravel. After 76, first violins come in again with their little wandering octaves above, and the harmonized melody continues. First oboe is taking the lead here, and underneath we have a variety of little accompanying instruments. 
using the lower winds for the most part, but just a little touch of first horn in there. What you should listen for in this part is not only the beautifully flowing lyrical oboe above, but also listen for the contrasts of timbral quality as these different instruments come and go. Not only the poignancy and the effectiveness of the contrast, but also the seamlessness of how they trade off one to another. It's one of those things where even an experienced musician might not be paying that much attention and just feel, oh, that was a wonderful little woodwind chorale, and not really realize or focus on too much the fact that it's going from bassoons below to clarinets below, and then back to bassoons in a higher position, right? And then with this F sharp here in the first horn, sounding F sharp, with the clarinets playing around it. In fact, you should listen very, very carefully for that beautifully held F sharp by the first horn player of the Thailand Philharmonic, which we're going to have a listen to in a minute. Uh, he is coming from behind and he plays so beautifully balanced within the scope of all of these players. And it, this is the kind of thing that takes a lot of work. There tends to be a misconception among developing orchestrators and just the casual audience member, and that is that wind players, brass players are just really working hard when they're playing loudly, but actually the reverse can be true. A lot of the loud, obvious stuff is easy to play and easy to control sometimes, but the very fine kinds of blending and balancing that a passage like this takes is a lot of work. It really does take a lot of listening to each other and guidance from the conductor sometimes. But yeah, we see the same condensation, harmonic condensation here, right? coming together. And then, of course, this note here, this held concert F-sharp, harkens back to this nice long F-sharp here in the first violins. So that just is a way of bringing the phrase to an end once again in the same way, even though there was some development between these two parts of the direction and arc of the melody. And, of course, that frees up the violins to be able to come in here on this F sharp practically just dovetailing over from the horn, though it won't really exactly sound that way, but psychologically that will be an effective strategy. Then after that we return to the low serious interpretation of the left hand, and it's pretty much the same as before, right? The lower strings in the background, the bassoon family and bass clarinet a little bit in the foreground so you can get that more resonant dark Russian sound. And similar stuff happening here with the seconds and violas taking over on this just to provide a little bit of contrast in terms of position, right? The uh, the layout of the orchestra having a different psychological effect for the audience, right? They can actually hear this long stretch of tremolo octaves wandering around in front of them on the stage as this grumbling bass melody does its thing. Let's listen for all of those touches, especially try to keep your ears peeled for this F sharp being played underneath the end of this line here in the two oboes, which I think is very cool to bring back the second oboe in underneath just as it was before, even though there were all these very effective doublings by other instruments. It really helps to bring this phrase to an incredibly graceful close two times in a row.
When I look at this screen, I feel that Henry Wood, the first non-Russian orchestrator of this work, was justified in removing his orchestration from publication or from dissemination out of respect to Ravel's genius because it would be hard to find a page that was as carefully crafted, ingeniously orchestrated as this one. This is just simply remarkable. It's the height of craft. It's just amazing. It's hard for me actually to break down everything that is happening here because it's so beautifully intricately complex. As you may have heard before, Stravinsky gave Ravel what he felt was the ultimate compliment by saying that he was a Swiss watchmaker. And some people have thought that that was an insult, maybe pointing out that Ravel might be mechanical or unfeeling or something like that, but not at all. What Stravinsky meant to express was that his pages of orchestration and his musical content was so beautifully integrated. It was like an incredibly complex device that basically ran itself. It was so perfectly tuned and timed and conceived. I feel that this is one of those passages where Mussorgsky's craft has been elevated to the highest with the help of another orchestrator. Let's just break down some of the more obvious components here. Here is where, musically, the emotion turns into one of a kind of solemn peace and contentment and letting go and everything else. It's his beautiful friend, Victor Hartman, uh, in the serenity of repose. I don't know. It's 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 definitely heartfelt thanks and reverence and everything else in memory of his departed comrade. I think that that is really what's being expressed here. Let's just start with these F sharps in the flutes, right? So this is backing up the same exact pitches, tremolo, in the violins. Then there is a big rest here. Now you might think, well, okay, so there's a gap there, but there actually isn't because if you look down here at the cellos and the contrabasses, they are playing the exact same pitches on these harmonic nodes. Okay, so these are the nodes of a major third and of a major sixth above the D string. And they're actually the same exact pitch. These are just the more resonant places on the strings to play them for those for each of those instruments, whether cello or double bass. So closer to the nut for the bass player so they don't have to move their hand around too much to find out where to play it, but more nearer the middle of the string for the cellos because that gives them more room on either side of the node uh, for the string to vibrate and so on. So these pitches here are exactly the same as these two octaves higher, right? So this B will excite an F sharp two octaves higher than this one, right? Which is this note here. And then the same thing goes for this. Um, on this F sharp, you get a note that is two octaves higher, right? So if we remember our octave transposition down, two octaves up is this note. So the same tremolo is carried through, but notice that it is a different color, right? Because it is harmonic as opposed to just a normally fingered note. And that brings up the entire architecture of this page, in fact. Notice how I kind of took the back door to talk about a global concept. And that is that we have two kind of opposing colors, that of the winds and 
that of the strings, trading off with each other almost seamlessly across the page. And that is where the genius comes in for me. And the better the orchestra, the more seamless this can be. It's almost like a challenge to Kusevitsky, who commissioned this, remember, to see if he could get the orchestras to perform to an absolute fine point of expression in pulling this off. And I'd say the Thai Philharmonic gets really, really close to perfection with this. I mean, that's, that's a great orchestra. And I'm so honored, once again, that they allowed me to use their performance of this. They do a great job with this, it's, and it's really, really, really hard to get it to be absolutely perfect. So, if you look throughout this page, you'll notice that that F-sharp is being traded off back and forth between the flutes plus the firsts, and then trading off down to the tremolo on the lower strings. Occasionally, you have the second flute taking a couple of different notes here just because of the harmony of the whole page and so on. And we can get to that later. But we always have the first flute coming back to support the top line of the tremolo octaves here. Okay. <laughs> now, let's talk about how those elements trade off and what they trade off into. One thing that I think is just genius here is this little pizzicato of the double bass on this low D, which is being doubled by this low F in the clarinet sounding D, right? It's the same exact pitch and the same exact register. So it's as if this low clarinet was part of this pizzicato, right? So the pizzicato goes pluck and then its resonance continues on as a function of the second clarinet. I just think that's really a cool idea. It reminds me of the old ensonic keyboards where they would take the articulation from one instrument and then the sustain from another. So you can see that experiments like that were already happening in orchestration, at least for Ravel. And that happens again here, right? Same exact thing. Okay, now let's talk about oboe and English horn playing octaves, right? Remember your transposition of a fifth. So this is the lower E to the higher E in first oboe. So we've got this very simple, eloquent snatch of melody here by these two double reed instruments. And that dovetails right into these divisi second violins and violas. Right, so this same C-sharp is where this ends. Remember, this is a C-sharp concert, right? So it's not a perfect trade-off. It's not a perfect dovetail, but it is still very effective, right? And the harmony comes in under that, right, as the clarinets let go and the bassoons let go. And bassoons, by the way, are also part of this. Right, we've got the A and the B sharp here, which form a minor third to the ear. And then way up here, we've got this D sharp here, sounding C, right? And that gets taken over here by E sounding C sharp, right? Which is the same as this note right here. And then this low A here, sounding F sharp, is the same as this note here. And then we've got the A sharp and the C sharp, which are being covered by the top two divisi violas. So all of this harmony is just dovetailing over to the middle strings, right? And then this beautiful, elegant touch in here. And this is really fun. This could have been done by two harps, really. Um, but it's just one harp tuned and harmonically, right? So you have F sharp and G flat being played together, and it's the same pitch as this low note here. 
And then same thing here, C sharp and D flat being played together and harmonically. So it's almost like a piano, isn't it? To have those doubled strings. And I feel it's more effective just on one harp because it's the sense that the resonance is close together, right? And that it will be perfectly synchronized by one player plucking those strings at the same time. There is the potential for an inexact rhythm if it's shared between two players. So Ravel is hedging his bets and getting a piano-like sound. This same C sharp D flat doubled here. So notice how that just creates this overlapping pattern here of resonance for that F sharp fifth in the bass while the harp continues to climb over an F sharp major chord. All right. Then pretty much the same exact thing happens note for note in the next bar. Once it's been perfectly crafted, there is no need to change it, no need to alter it. Just give the orchestra and the conductor one more chance to get this devilishly crafted piece of orchestration another try. And then we go into two more bars that are essentially doubled, except that the function of the melody is traded off between first clarinet and muted trumpet, right? So that is the only real huge difference between these two pairs of bars. And it's actually a neat contrast because there is a bit of a relationship. I mean, let's remember that clarinet means little trumpet, right? Uh, the clarino used to be a high trumpet that had a beautiful piercing sound. So the clarinet came along and that became associated with that sound. And it does have a trumpet-like bell and so on. And there is a relationship, especially when you put a mute on the trumpet. So there is something similar about that, especially also keeping in mind that this is the lowest part of the clarino range. And that also has a bit of a relationship to this middle range muted in trumpet. So that would be something really cool for you to listen for, the differences and similarities between these two timbres. Notice the balancing here too, piano espressivo in clarinet, which let's remember is a non-vibrato instrument, which is echoed pianissimo by trumpet, which will be about the same dynamic level, right, in this texture. Keeping in mind, though, that one of the little touches here is that one of the tiny bits of difference here between these two pairs of bars is that the second time around, Ravel asks the brass and the flutes to take it down a notch, which is echoed in the strings right around here. And that is just part of bringing this whole passage to an elegant pianissimo close. All right, well, let's not get hooked up in that. Let's see how the rest of the passage is working. So we still have that F sharp note on top being shared by flutes and first violins and then taken over very icily by the harmonics here in the lower strings. And this is pretty much the same here in the middle strings, this harmonization. But notice the functions here of the harmony have changed from winds to horns, right? And second flute. So that is what is being asked to trade off into this same harmony. And if you look at it, you'll see a lot of the same notes the end of this melody note here, E, sounding C sharp on top of this chord. And then we've got an F sharp major triad, if you remember your transposition, which is being taken over here by the violas and so on. What's cool here is 
this low B fifth sounding B fifth, which is dovetailed into in the next two bars by the divisi staves of the lower strings, this low B fifth in here, which is neat. It's dragging from below and opening up the harmony that is implied. And that's just really wonderful. And I think there's also something very cool about playing an octave below both times on muted horn. First below the clarinet and second time below the first trumpet. So that is also a very neat touch. Here finally the harmony just allows itself to turn into this big huge open B major chord. Same little strategy here and harmonic notes in the harp and four part harmony in the horns, clarinets above that. Remember this is still muted, right? So it's going to have a sort of distant kind of slightly raspy sound. But that is tamed a little bit by the lower strings and then we end on this fantastically gorgeous chord here. If this is done right, then these harmonic elements that are holding will release into this harmony here indistinguishably. <laughs> okay? So you'll have these F sharp tremolos giving way once again to the tremolos of the lower strings and then adding yet another octave here with the viola. This is going to result in an F sharp even an octave higher than that. Then we've got a big old B major chord. Now don't forget that we've got an enharmonically tuned harp here, right? To G flat major, which is essentially F sharp major in the context of this ending. So it's very easy for this to be played in harmonics with the loosest strings and most resonant ones being the flat strings. And we have a doubling of that chord with the piccolo on top, B, D sharp, and then completing the triad F sharp on top in the piccolo, sounding an octave higher, right? And this note right here is being doubled by our very high harmonic note here in the violas. As to these thirds here, they are being doubled by these harmonic nodes here in the second violins. So if the intonation is correct from all of these string players and the harp and flutes, you end up with this gorgeously radiant chord here. But it all depends on whether or not these players here are paying attention to the transition over to that chord, if they dovetail dynamically. If one was to just hold this all the way to the end and then just let go, that would be kind of tragic. But usually the players will round this off so that by the time they reach here, this first half of a beat, it really is a dynamic dovetail, if not a complete harmonic one. So that very clinical description of what's going on here might make you think, oh, of course, that all makes sense. Wow, that is so easy, right? It's kind of like uh, after Sherlock Holmes explains his deductive reasoning to Watson, Watson says, well, it's all just so deucedly simple, isn't it? And then uh, Holmes says, well, of course it is after I explain it to you, <laughs> right? And that's what I want you to watch out for. You don't let my explanations lessen the wonder of what's going on here, the, the sheer beautiful perception of how this works. I cannot imagine another orchestrator of Ravel's time coming up with this gorgeously, beautifully, and elegantly simple approach. I feel that there might be a tendency to overdo it, right? To come up with all sorts of interestingly, intriguingly interlocked passages that didn't have the radiance of what Ravel is 
orchestrating here. I mean, this whole idea here with the muted horns and the clarinets on top and the other strings, both tremolo and just normal, functioning as well alongside it. I mean, it's just, they're just such cool ideas here that they are simple in one way and then just inspired in another. So with that long explanation of actually not a very long passage, I will turn the listening over to you. Listen for all of those things. Listen for the way that the oboe and English horn work together in octaves. And what is the contrast between that and the clarinet and first horn working in octaves? And then the muted trumpet and first horn working in octaves. What are the steps towards that timbrely and how is that all supported by the rest of the orchestration? Listen for the way that a texture that is mostly winds elegantly gives over to a texture that is mostly strings. And notice how the more individual instruments are given the burden of thematic expression, whereas the strings, which are the geniuses of texture in the orchestra, are allowed to hang on to the harmony while the harp does this beautifully effective and simple and harmonic unison arpeggio. It's just a beautiful treasure box here. This is one of my favorite parts in the entire suite as orchestrated by Ravel. Have a listen to that and I will see you very very soon on Patreon for Baba Yaga which is almost like a reaction to all of this peace and beautiful harmony in the most savage way.